We are going back to the moon at last. After a hurting and annoying half-century break, humans are returning to the surface of the moon. Elon Musk's lunar starship was chosen to deliver the crew and a good amount of cargo to the lunar surface. But what will the astronauts do there and how? in sea to resource utilization is a nice concept, but it is high time to switch to higher gear with it. What can we find on the moon and how can we use it? And we need the energy for it. But where will that energy come from? Besides the astronauts in their newly developed spacesuits, there are also going to be robots exploring, working and helping the astronauts. Why is it a big challenge to use a robotic arm when the temperature of the environment is extremely low? Is Cold Arm the name of another cartoon hero? This is a moon heavy episode, so stay tuned. Artemis is the name of the new giant program at NASA and other collaborating agencies and private companies which will bring us back to the surface of the moon. And as it has been emphasized many times, this time we are going to stay. But what can people do on the moon besides admiring the view of our beautiful blue marble home planet and the millions of stars in the blackness of space? Turns out a lot of work is waiting for the inhabitants of the moon. The moon is a chamber of treasures, but it is not giving these up for free. The astronauts will have to work for getting all those resources hiding in the regolith, hiding in the always shadowed craters of the lunar south pole. This work has already begun decades ago. The first step is always the discovery, you know, to find the resources, finding what we want to mine and to collect. Many different space probes did that. Lunar Prospector, Selene, Chandrayaan 1 and 2, Elcross, Lady, and the series of Chang'e probes were observing and measuring the moon, the structure and composition of the lunar surface. The Chang'e 5 even returned samples from the moon with its ascent vehicle. Based on these investigations, we know that we can mine precious metals, valuable water ice and useful oxygen on the lunar surface. Moreover, helium-3 can also be extracted from lunar regolith, which can be used for future fusion power plants, as the helium-3 fusion chain is a neutronic, which is a big plus, and perhaps also in cool expand style spacecraft propulsion systems some decades later. How amazing would that be? The latest discoveries also showed that besides water ice, frozen carbon dioxide could be gathered in so-called cold traps. These are the coldest regions on the moon, deep in craters near the lunar poles, never lit and warmed by the light of the sun. The Diviner Lunar Radiometer Experiment, an instrument flying aboard NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, provided temperature data for over 11 years. The researchers analyzed this data and identified the areas which can trap carbon dioxide. The temperature in these shadowed areas never rises above 60 Kelvin, respective 352 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 213 degrees Celsius. Altogether, these locations are covering 204 square kilometers, with the largest area in the Amundsen crater hosting 82 square kilometers of these coal traps. While the existence of CO2 is not yet confirmed in these extreme cold spots, it is highly probable. Now we know without a doubt that these traps exist and we know where we can find them. There is scientific value in these carbon dioxide deposits as these ultra cold spots can help to clear some interesting questions about the origins of water and other volatiles in the Earth-Moon system and to understand how these materials arrived. Besides this, having carbon and water on the Moon allows us to create methane which can be used as propellant for the Starship. Together with locally produced oxygen, Starships that landed on the Moon could be refueled, so even more cargo can be brought from Earth for the future Moon bases. Because fuel for the way back from the lunar surface does not have to be carried along all the way from Earth. It would also be possible to send propellant from the Moon to top up the orbiting starships around the Earth before they begin the long journey to Mars. You know, just shoot up propellant back to Earth orbit from the Moon with a mass driver. Now that is a fascinating concept. 
And please subscribe to our small channel here if you want some clickbait free space news, promise we won't even use lines like finally happened or this changes everything and other BS headlines like those. You know, just pure space news. Thanks a lot in advance. And it is not only propellant that we can produce on the moon. Lots of valuable metals can be found in the grey dusty lunar regolith. How could these resources be extracted from the rocks and dust? The company Lunar Resources offers a solution for it. The Houston based company's technology has its roots at NASA. The method is called molten regolith electrolysis. The regolith is heated up to 1600 degrees Celsius, is then melted and then electrolyzed and the result is 40-45% to oxygen, 20% silicon, 10% aluminium and smaller amounts of iron and titanium. Lunar Resources experimental reactor has a 1 meter diameter with about the same height and weighs roughly 1.5 tons. They plan to send the reactor with the Lunar Payload Services mission. With small landers, it won't be an easy task to safely land with this heavy payload, but for a lunar starship, this device is a piece of cake to be delivered onto the surface of the moon. The reactor will be fed by a small rover, which will collect and transfer the regolith for it. According to the plans, 100 kilograms of regolith will be consumed and processed by the unit in under 24 hours. If successful, the reactor can pave the way for a lunar industry. The extracted materials can be used for producing solar cells, wires, glass, structural elements and walls of habitats, machines and perhaps also spacecraft in the future. Solar arrays will be needed to provide energy for the moon bases, but there is the big 14 day lasting problem of the lunar night. What can give us energy in this long darkness or in the eternal darkness of the depth of the polar craters? There are many possibilities. Nuclear energy is one of the obvious choices. NASA in coordination with the Department of Energy is asking companies to suggest concepts of fission surface power systems which could be developed, built and launched in 10 years for a demonstration on the lunar surface. The requirement for this fission based energy production device is autonomous operation. It should be remotely controllable from the deck of a lunar lander or a lunar rover. The nuclear device should generate a minimum of 40 kilowatts of electricity. As we know NASA ran the kilopower project, but that has a smaller power output only about 10 kilowatts. NASA would also use the gathered knowledge on the fission surface power systems on spaceship based nuclear propulsion systems which rely on reactors to generate power. So solar power together with nuclear power will be able to provide continuous energy for the operation of a lunar base. There will be regolith processing reactors too, but we need robots and machines to help the astronauts to work outside of the habitat and science modules. These robots or robot rovers will use robotic arms to manipulate the environment, to grab rocks, tools, to dig the regolith and so on and so forth. We already are using such robotic arms in space. Think of the Kenneth arm series on the ISS and we can find a similar big robotic arm in use on the Chinese space station as well. Not to mention the thousands of robots used in factories on Earth. But the extreme cold regions of the moon and even the cold lunar night raises different requirements for these robotic arms. The motors and the joints of the arms must be heated to remain operational in the very low temperatures. That consumes precious energy, which should be used in more useful ways. NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is working on a special robotic arm to solve this problem. The cold arm is planned to improve the utility of the lunar rovers. Cold arm will be able to work even in extreme cold lunar environments without the need for heat. The brain of this robotic arm leverages the highly capable smartphone processing technology used for Ingenuity, the successful Mars helicopter. The cold arm will be able to scoop and analyze the lunar soil, deploy instruments and capture photos of the lander's surroundings. This new robotic arm features 4 degrees of freedom 
with the help of movable joints and is approximately 6.5 feet or 2 meters long. The arm will be equipped with cameras for 3D mapping and a 3D printed titanium scoop and various other attachments are also validated by the cold arm team. The control software can work autonomously, performing various movements, collect pictures and sensor data. With future updates of the avionics software, this cool, a pun quite likely intended, robotic arm will be able to perform autonomous operations on ocean worlds like Jupiter's moon Europa. Cold Arm is targeted to fly as a technology demonstration on a commercial robotic lander within the next five years via NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. So you see, there is really a lot of cool stuff happening with regards to our return to the moon and we can't wait to finally see humanity back on the nearest celestial body. So then, friends of human spaceflight, our team wishes you a nice day, all the best from us and on to the future.